26 games, each two more than the regular schedule called for. The Bums from Brooklyn, the Giants from New York have come down to the wire to where it is all or nothing. talking about this afternoon's hero as yet unknown, but the man and the hour are about to meet. If there is a goat, his name will echo down the corridor of time. Ralph Franca from Mount Vernon, New York, is going on the mound to throw for the Brooklyn. Ralph Lynn Ralph, who wears his number 13, and will that be lucky for the Brooklyn Dodgers here? at the door of disaster in the last half of the ninth inning. Boy, I'm telling you what they're going to say about this one, I don't know. Here is the Royal Scott, Bobby Trump, just dangerous as a great dame behind the meat counter. Before World War II, much of New York's baseball history was written by one team, the New York Yankees. The Giants had some success in the 20s and 30s, but the 1940s was a vast wasteland for the team from Manhattan. The Dodgers were just as inept. Before Brooklyn made an unexpected appearance in the 1941 series, it had been two decades since the team had played a game in October. But shortly after the Second World War, that changed, and New York City became the baseball capital of the world. Beginning in 1947, at least one of the three New York teams would appear in the World Series in 10 of the next 11 seasons. Unfortunately for Dodger and Giant fans, it was still that hated team in the Bronx that did most of the winning. The Yankees were sort of this elitist, corporate, pinstripe types. Their fans expected winning, didn't bother to learn much about baseball, and rare instances when the Yankees weren't winning, they weren't Yankee fans. Yankee fans I thought of as front runners, the kind of people who rooted for the government in an income tax suit. The Yankees were up there in the Bronx, up on a hill. They were just cascading. Yankees had ushers, had mittens, when they brought you down to a seat. You felt you had to wear a tie. Yankees Day was for tourists. Directly across the Harlem River from Yankee Stadium stood the polo grounds, the odd-shaped, run-down home of the New York Giants. I remember coming out of the subway. The stop was 155th Street and 8th Avenue, and there was this big green thing there, this big green edifice. And you're greeted by the smell, smoke, tar, cheap cigars. It was one of the worst places in the world to watch a ball game. For instance, if you sat out in right field, oftentimes you couldn't see the right fielder who was right below you. And you'd have to yell over to somebody, hey, what happened on that play? Where did the ball go? It felt as if the seats had never been changed. There was pigeon droppings on these old green wooden seats and the facade of the polo grounds looked like it hadn't changed since 1908. We detested the polo grounds. The ride was interminable. And it was this foreboding, dark place. We detested it. Far from uninviting, Brooklyn's Ebbets Field was a vibrant, intimate, charming park. A day at Ebbets was like a baseball carnival for both the Dodgers and their fans. You paid your 75 cents for the bleacher seat, or if you were really flush, the buck and a half for a grandstand seat. You were right on the field. You could lean against the fences and yell, hi, Jackie, hi, Pee Wee, hi, Duke, hi, Carl. I can stand on the mound. I hear guys talking to you real easy. 
It wasn't like they were yelling loud. This guy's just talking, hey, Oisk, hey, Oisk, draw it through his head. I mean, it was wonderful. It was one of the greatest places in the world for a comic to get his material. They were so funny, and they were so outlandishly brash. Different as they were, Dodger and Giant fans had one thing in common, an intense dislike for each other, passed down through generations of disdain. My father and I'd go over to Ebbets Field. It was almost like going into another world. One of the guards used to come down and sit behind us because sometimes they'd throw things at us. <laughs> I would never go to the Polo Grounds. Never. Even when the Dodgers were playing, I hated the Polo Grounds, I hated Giants. That was part of the fun, is to hate. The hate is as important as the loving. Well, you hated the Dodgers because you were a Giant fan, and that was the way it's supposed to be. To beat the Dodgers, it's something I lived off all winter long. If you were a Giant, you were hated. Sid Gordon, Jewish guy, grew up three blocks from Ebbets Field. Play for the Giants, we hated him. I would have rooted for the Red Russians over the Brooklyn Dodgers. All I wish for them were 14 inning games played in rain. They hated the Dodger fans and the borough of Brooklyn because in Brooklyn, we had more. We had the trolley car, we had the subway, we had plenty of kosher delicatessens, and we had 500 pool rooms. They were jealous. For instance, after the game, did they have a Nathan's to go to on Coney Island? No, no Nathan's for them. They didn't have a Coney Island. They had Orchard Beach. No comparison. No comparison. As the 51 season began, there was no comparison between the two teams. The famed Boys of Summer were in the early years of their historic run. 1951, the Dodgers had Hodges, Robinson, Reese, Cox. Still the best infield I've ever seen. And right field for all. Terrific ball player. Center field, Snyder, and, whew, and a great team. And of course, Campanella back at the plate. And we had a good pitching staff. Newcomb, Preacher Rowe, Erskine. We felt we were the favorites and we should win. We had a good, we had a good ball club. Ralph Branca was one of those good Brooklyn pitchers. By 1951, Branca was already an established and popular Dodger, a 20-game winner at the age of 21, and a native New Yorker. My father's from Italy and my mother's from a small town in Hungary. And they met in New York City, east side of Harlem, got married, and then moved to Mount Vernon. There was a mixed neighborhood. I mean, there was a German family, Irish families, a Jewish family, and about three black families. So we had the League of Nations on that block. My father had many jobs. He was a trolley car conductor. He had a barber shop. My mother, when you say housewife, she had no time for anything else. I mean, I'm one of 17. When I was growing up, there was 14 children alive, and my sister died when I was 13, so it was 13 growing up. One of the reasons I wore number 13 when I got to Brooklyn. I went from baseball, to football, to basketball. I rooted for the Giants. Mellot and Carl Hubble were my heroes. Then I signed with the Dodgers, June 6, 1944, which is D-Day, and for me it was Dodger Day. And now June 11th, I was in the bullpen in the Polo Grounds, and they called me in, and I remember walking in from that bullpen. I mean, I walked, and I walked, and I walked, like I was walking on a treadmill. And believe it or not, I struck out the first three guys I faced. A tough, strong, hard-throwing right-hander with an explosive fastball. Branca won 53 games before his 24th birthday. But in 1951, Charlie Dressen, the Dodgers' new manager, moved Branca to the bullpen, where he spent the first month of Brooklyn's up-and-down season. They needed a starter, and I started against Robin Roberts in Philadelphia. I went seven innings, and it rained. And I went in, took a shower, got new oil on my arm, put on a new uniform, and I went out and got the last six guys out. So I pitched a complete game and beat Robin. And then I won like two to one, three to one, four to two, and all complete games. 
So I think that kind of stabilized the staff, and I think it turned the team around. By contrast, Leo DeRocher's Giants hadn't won the pennant since 1937. And while there was some hope following a strong finish in 1950, the 51 season began poorly. I used to keep a scrapbook out of the Daily News clips or Daily Mirror of each game. 1951, I started it with good intent in my heart. They came out of the gate and lost three straight to the Dodgers in the polo grounds. The Phillies came in and swept them. Then the Braves came in and knocked them off. And they had to go back to Ebbets Field. And the Dodgers took two out of the first three. Now we've lost 11 in a row. That was the end of my 1951 scrapbook. We all knew that something needed to happen to the Giants, uh, some new player, some new spark. That player was 20-year-old Willie Mays, whose boyish enthusiasm was a welcome change on the veteran Giants, as well as on the streets of New York. He was as much at home on 8th Avenue playing stickball, which he did with kids up in Harlem, as he was on a baseball diamond. A day game, they wake me up at 9 o'clock. I go out and play about two or three innings with them, buy the ice cream for them. Actually, I learned how to hit the breaking ball because you had to bounce the ball and it would break, and I would hit it all the time. Not all the time, at least not right away. Mays found his first few weeks in the majors overwhelming, especially at the plate, where his batting average dipped to 0.43. Willie Mays, when he first joined the Giants, he just couldn't buy a base hit, was hitting an awful tough luck. And uh, one day I came in the clubhouse, Willie was sitting in front of his locker, and he looked up and he said, Mr. Leo, he says, I just can't do anything right. He says, I just can't buy a base hit. He says, I just can't help this club at all. And I said, that's all right, Willie. We brought you up here to play center field and you're going to play center field. You're the center fielder in this ball club today, and you're going to be the center fielder tomorrow and next week and next month. And I think that took him out of the slump, and uh, he did come on to, to hit quite well the balance of the way. When Willie would do something extraordinary, he would have a suit hanging in the locker next day, or half a dozen shirts, or a wristwatch, or something, to let him know, just keep on doing what you're doing. He got to the point where he got so much stuff, he started distributing it to us, the rest of the players in the club out. We'd go over there and look and said, uh, you know, what, what do you got new? And he said, here, you can have this, you can have that. <laughs> While Mays' turnaround made him increasingly popular with his teammates and giant fans, it was a complication. Willie played center field, a position that belonged to a well-liked, established veteran. I knew that he must have been a great prospect because we had a great center fielder in Bobby Thompson. Bobby Thompson was not a rinky-dink. When I was told that uh, I'm going to be moved out of center field, I accepted that. I was brought up in a responsible way to do what I was told and follow instructions. Robert Brown Thompson was born in Glasgow, Scotland on October 25th, 1923. I was the youngest of six kids, and my dad decided that America was the best place for his kids to grow up. There was a long waiting list to get over to this country, and he'd been on that list. Well, wouldn't you know it, my mother was expecting me when his name came up to come over, and he had this decision to make whether to stay there and help his wife and kids or go forward with his plan. Well, my dad did come over here on his own. He was a cabinet maker, and actually it took him two years before he was able to send for us to come over here. We landed, and off to Staten Island we went. My dad took the baseball, and would you believe it? He was a Dodger fan. <laughs> he rooted for the Dodgers. In youth leagues, Bobby excelled at baseball, but his days as a player would have been short-lived if not for his older brother, Jim. My brother was my mentor. He's the guy that bought me my first glove when he worked for Sears Roebuck. And he's the guy that had me out in the backyard when I was strong enough to hold a bat. When I first went away to play Class D ball out of high school, uh, I wasn't doing too well, and I guess he could tell by my letters. And he'd write to me and tell me to keep your chin up, keep hustling, and 
get mad, hit somebody, sliding into second base. And after a lot of instructions, he signed it. He says, you're a severest critic, but most ardent admirer. And that, that kind of, ooh, that took hold of me. <laughs> he had a world of talent. He had power, he had speed. But he was just inconsistent. If you look at his record, he had a good year, bad year, good year, bad year. Unfortunately for both Thompson and the Giants, 51 was shaping up to be one of those bad years. At the end of April, the last place New Yorkers had only three wins. And while May and June saw some improvement, by mid-July, the Giants still trailed Jackie Robinson and the first place Dodgers, a confident team led by the most confident of players. In 1951, Jackie Robinson was at his peak as both a player and as a controversial figure. He bats 338. He's the dominant player on the Dodger team. But he's also completely liberated himself. In 1947, Jackie was told by Mr. Vicky he was not to take part in any arguments on the field. He was to do as he's told. Well, in 1951, I call him and the officer, Jackie, those days are over. You've had your probation now. Four years are up. Do what you want to do. It was payback time, and he was dishing it out verbally, physically, on the bases. It was a game in Boston that we played, and the Dodgers were winning at 11 to 3. And Jackie stole home with a big lead, and they got on his case. And when he started razzing him, Jackie got back to the dugout. He turned around, patted his backside before he kissed him. His voice had great carry to it, and that laugh, uh, it was an irritating type laugh to the opposition. He would always holler something at Leo because he didn't like Leo. And he and DeRocher would jaw back and forth and call each other every name in the book. They hit him with everything he could, personal comments about Lorraine Day, who DeRocher had married. Jack used to accuse Leo of wearing Lorraine's perfume. Robinson was up, and as Robinson was in there, DeRocher bullhorn voice said, my dick to you, Robinson. And Robinson didn't step out of the batter's box, didn't lower his bat. He said, give it to Lorraine. She needs it more than I do. The tense interaction between Robinson and DeRocher was nothing new. In 1948, Leo had been Jackie's manager with the Dodgers. And the two developed an intense dislike for each other. When the Dodgers swept free from the Giants in early August, their 12th win in 15 games between the teams, Brooklyn's lead grew to 12 and a half games, and Robinson's taunting grew even louder. Dressen was hiring a kite. He uh, gave his players the green light to do a little bit of taunting. And the two locker rooms were side by side. There used to be a door in between. So Dressen comes down and he says, come on back to the door. We want to sing. The Giants are dead. The Giants are dead. The Giants is dead. Some players didn't want to do it. Others did willingly. And you could hear one voice above everybody else. It was Jackie's. Eat your heart out, Leo. You'll be last before the season's over. This is something that just totally infuriated the Giants, and they didn't bang on the door back to them. They didn't yell. DeRosa just says, fellas, he said, you hear what they're saying? Hey, let's get our act together and go on out and show them what we can do. We're 13 and a half games ahead on August 13th. 13 and a half. It's a joke. I think the whole team felt we had it won. I mean, how good is a team going to go to catch you? We beat the Phillies two out of three. They beat the Braves three out of three. We'd win three out of four, they win four out of four. Spawn and Sane, Roberts and Simmons, we were beating everybody that they threw at us. The starting pitcher would get the lead of one run and somebody on the bench would say, okay, there's your lead, hold it. And they did. And Leo said, okay, whatever you do, everybody do the same thing tomorrow. He was just uh, very, very superstitious. Leo had the thing nobody could touch to Bobby Thompson's glove. Thompson never brought his glove in. Leo would keep it in the coach's box. And he would tap it three times and then touch the bag and come back and put it down. Herman Franks wore the same seersucker suit for 16 days. I used to wear these underwear pants with ants on them. Well, I wore those pants every day to the point where the first thing those guys looked for were those pants hanging up. Every game we won made it more important to listen to the next one. It was more important than saying good morning to your wife. You wanted to find out how they did. 
Giants just didn't stop winning, period. And it became a very scary thing for Dodger fans. It seemed there was almost a supernatural element. I saw all these insanities. I was just hoping that I was wrong. Philadelphia left field, the Dick Siska misplayed a drive by Monty Irvin that led in the winning two runs. And you said, uh-huh, uh-huh. It was like a divine plan was unfolding. And when they were chipping away at that lead, 10 and a half. Like somebody coming up behind you and hitting with a club. Eight and a half. And we got closer and closer and closer. Six and a half. Here's a shot and there, here's one on the elbow. Five and a half. And you just had this sense of doom. It was excruciating. I mean, it was like pillory. Turning their season around, the Giants had won 16 straight in August and now trailed the Dodgers by just five games with a little more than a month to play. Monty Irvin led the revival, along with a resurgent Bobby Thompson, who found a new home at third and a new stroke at the plate. At the midpoint in 1951, he was batting 232. Lockman and Leo DeRocher got together and decided to adapt his stance to give him more of a crouch. I thought, hey, what have I got to lose? You know, to bend the knees a little more, crouch over, get a little more aggressive. And I got pulling the ball more. As much as Thompson's resurrection helped the Giants, the real catalyst for New York's change in fortune may have come on June 30th with the acquisition of Pittsburgh infielder Hank Shenz. Although Shenz did not play in the field or have an at-bat in a single game, he did help devise and execute an elaborate sign-stealing system with manager Leo DeRocher's blessing. From a hidden perch in DeRocher's office in center field, the Giants stole the opposing catcher's signs, relayed them electronically to the Giant bullpen, where they were then passed on to the hitter. This is the infamous spyglass that my dad introduced into the 1951 baseball season. And it doesn't look like much when it's closed, very small, but when extended to its full length, it enabled my dad, uh, sitting in the center field, uh, I guess the center field office of Mr. DeRocher, to zoom right on in on the signals that the catcher was giving. And it was relayed from Leo's office to the bullpen, from the bullpen, to the hitter, and you had like two or three seconds to do it. The player entrusted with relaying the signs from the bullpen was little-used catcher Sal Evars, who listened intently for a telltale signal. No buzz, fastball. One buzz, breaking ball. If there was no buzz, not a ball in my hand, I did nothing with the ball. If it was a breaking ball, I threw it up in the air. Leo's word when he heard about whether we could do this, what the hell do we have to lose? So we did it. Don Mueller hit five home runs in two days. You know who Don Mueller was? He was a left-handed batter, hit balls inside of third base. All of a sudden, he's hitting bombs out in right field. They never caught on. We got five runs ahead, we stop. They come close to us, here we go again. We knew every pitch. Hey, let's face it, we stole signs. Sure, I took them once in a while, but I didn't like the idea of it. Nothing to be proud of, frankly. I doubt if they helped me that much. Not many guys were people who really relied on it. You have a matter of seconds because that pitcher's not standing there doing anything. He's in the middle of his windup sometimes when this was given to us, and we would hurriedly throw a ball up in the air. So it was a very cumbersome and sometimes less than accurate system. No matter how you get the signs, if you know what's coming, you still got to hit it. And a lot of times it's not that easy to hit it. And people say, hey, knowing the signs doesn't have any effect, then why would you do it if it didn't help? Once they got the signs, was there a magic wand that made them 37 and 7? It would be easy to attribute the Giants' remarkable 16-game winning streak and torrid finish to their sign-stealing ability, but the numbers suggest a different story. And it turns out of all the Giants' batters, only three of them had an improvement in the second half of the season. Whitey Lockman, Monty Irvin, and Thompson, who went up by 120 points. All the rest went down dramatically. 
I would love to find some smoking gun that says, here is the number that shows the Giants stole the pennant. I don't see it. Not only that, but the Giants' batting average actually rose 17 points on the road and at the same time dropped 7 points at home. The pitching numbers are even more enlightening. From July 20th until the end of the season, the Giants' staff ERA was a full point lower than it had been earlier in the year. You can do all the stats that you want, all the figures. Figures lie and liars figure. And baseball is still played between the two white lines. All you have to do is get one hit. Some play, somehow, no one assigns. That's all you need is to win one game out of 44 games. Whether or not the sign stealing helped them, the Giants had clearly become a more confident and brash team, an attitude that mirrored their manager, Leo DeRocher. Leo had come off the streets and the pool halls of New England. He was a real hustler, and he would do anything to win a ball game. People put a lot of confidence in him because he was confidence personified. Leo was the dapperest man in baseball. He had clothes made, he had ties made, he had shoes made. Sharpest attack, he had a gold chain, he had that slick hair. He was natty, I mean natty. You could smell him three blocks away. He loved the perfume and stuff. I always thought he was fruity with all his stuff on. You know, he's kind of a Hollywood guy and he dressed like a Hollywood guy, he talked like one. He loved the show business crowd. He hung out with all the big shots. George Burns and Danny Kay and the Marx Brothers and Dean and myself. One spring training, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis were shooting a movie near where the Giants were training. And neither one of them was shy, said they would like to work out in the infield with the New York Giants. Therosha said, great, love to have you boys. And the whole day's workout was disrupted by these two clowns kicking ground balls. Does he still lose his temper the way he used to? He never lost his temper. Which Leo are you talking about? <laughs> I used to play cards with Leo, and, and he would yell at me, I'm raising you. He just was a volcano. Leo was anger personified. I never saw Leo play. He was supposed to be terrible. <laughs> oh, he's looking down from up there saying, I'll get you, you rat bastard. <laughs> DeRocher's confidence and bravado was in sharp contrast to his Brooklyn counterpart, the insecure and reserved Charlie Dressen. As Brooklyn's lead started to evaporate, a jittery Dressen reacted with curious moves that puzzled his players. When we were going well, Charlie was kind of loosey-goosey. And then when the Giants got close, he kind of tightened up. I think he made some awful moves. He ran the pitching staff into the ground. He basically started using just five pitches. Carl Erskine had an arm that was bothering him. Newcomb's arm toward the end of the season was getting tired. Dressen would constantly say, you're imagining it. He just didn't want to hear that. We got 11 pitchers that are sound and their arms in good shape. He knew absolutely nothing about pitching. Absolutely nothing. What he knows about pitching, you could put on the head of a pin in the boldest print in the world and still have room for the Constitution on it. In their last 44 games, the best the Dodgers could do was play 500 ball. Meanwhile, the Giants went 37 and 7 and finally caught Brooklyn with two games left. Still tied on the last day of the season, New York went to Boston where they beat the Braves 3-1 on a Bobby Thompson homer. After the win, the Giants excitedly looked to Philadelphia, where the Dodgers were in trouble. Brooklyn trailed the Phils 6-1 in the third inning of a game they now needed to win, just to force a playoff. Giants win early, they're on the train heading back and they're starting to celebrate a little. We had champagne on ice on the train. We were going to ride into Grand Central Station as the National League pennant winners. I couldn't stand it. A physical pain was going through me and I started to walk. And then someone said it's eight to five. So I was convinced at this point that my walking was making them score runs. And if I stopped my walking, they'd stop scoring. 
and it was eight to six. And when it came eight to seven, you say to God, I'll never curse or I'll never be bad to my parents again if you just let them win this game. You know, you're making a bargain with God. And as I'm walking, it's eight eight, and now the Phillies are up, but they have the bases loaded, and Wakeus hits this line drive, and your heart sinks. And out of nowhere, Robinson appears and spears that ball. He fell with the ball in the glove, and you hit him in the sternum here. So it knocked the wind out of him, and we thought, oh my God, he's gone. They think he might not be able to continue. And in fact, Pee Wee Reese has to push him out of the dugout the next inning to get him back on the field. Then he hit a home run in the 14th, so Jackie Robinson single-handedly saved the season. And the church bells ring in Brooklyn. And I was now miles from home. After 154 games, a three-game playoff was needed to decide the National League champion. The Dodgers won a coin toss, but Dressen surprisingly chose to play the first game at home, with the second and pivotal third game scheduled for the polo grounds. The feeling in my neighborhood in Brooklyn as we got ready for the first game was this is a better way to torture Giant fans. Let them tie us on the last day of the season, and now we're going to have a playoff and really stick it to them. In game one, with Ralph Branca pitching, Bobby Thompson hit a two-run homer in a 3-1 to -one New York win. With two home games left, Giant fans were brimming with confidence, especially when Dressen unexpectedly selected little-used pitcher Clem Labine to start game two. And I was up in section 20 saying, we got him, we got him. We go to the programs, we win 10 nothing. Labine pitches a shutout, it's a joke. They beat us and they dragged our noses through it. It was horrible. I'm jumping in the streets. My Dodgers are back, the Giants are dead. I jinxed them on October the 2nd, 1951, by being there. I couldn't go back for game three. In fact, I thought that game three might end in disaster. I went to sleep that night, and I remembered a line by Alexander Dumas. It's the last line of a book he wrote called The Man in the Iron Mask. It says, we live in hope and die in despair. And I said, my God, I hope that doesn't happen tomorrow. I was in the store with my brother. He was a florist on Pitkin Avenue in Brooklyn. And he starts to make a funeral wreath. And I said, uh, Ruby, what are you doing? He says, making this wreath with a sympathy to the Giants on the ribbon. And he says to me, when Brooklyn wins and we beat the New York Giants, we'll hop out of the stands with the wreath and place the wreath on home plate. We're going to bury the Giants. After 156 games, the bums from Brooklyn, the Giants from New York, have come down to the wire to where it is all or nothing. It was a dark day, sort of a bleary day, and I think there was nervous expectation for everyone. I mean, the fans, it was almost like you were afraid that your team was going to lose. The greatest show on earth, the Brooklyn Dodgers and the New York Giants final sudden death showdown payoff game. Bobby Thompson had pulled up at the polo grounds at the same time Gil and I did to go into the ballpark. And he said, Gil, I'd like to say goodbye to you now and wish you luck because one of us is going to be walking away from here very happy today and we may not get the chance to say goodbye. There was tension. I remember talking to Pee Wee and Jackie and saying, hey, you got any butterflies? 20 years from now, the fans will be talking about this afternoon zero as yet unknown, but the man and the hour are about to meet. And then when the game started, we didn't do too well in the beginning. A pitch to Robinson, swung on, driven down for a big hit in the hole. Here's Pee Wee Reeves around third on his way to the score. Run in, Dodgers lead one nothing. The Dodgers took that one to nothing lead into the seventh, behind a dominant Don Newcomb. With one out, Monty Irvin reached third, and up came Bobby Thompson. I'll never forget that time at bat. It was the toughest at bat of my life. Nuke felt like he was throwing 130 miles an hour. He got ahead of me two strikes. I was fighting for my life. 
crouched over, squeezing that bat. I had to get that run in. Hey, we're playing for the pennant. Giant elation, however, was fleeting. Robinson batting, and the pitch gets away from Westrom. Reese racing in to score. The Dodgers lead two to one. Bobby Thompson, the giant outfielder turned infielder, bobbles a hard hit grounder down the third base line. The Dodgers lead three to one. Foul delivered. This went down and threw Thompson off his club in the left field. Robinson around third on his way in with a fourth Dodger run. Dodgers lead four to one. When the Dodgers held that 4-1 lead in the bottom of the ninth, Thompson, who had failed to make two plays at third in the eighth, thought the Giants' season-long comeback was finished. I get on the bench and never more depressed in my life. I remember throwing down my glove thinking we just weren't good enough to go beyond this point. I went to bring out the wreath. I brought it out and I was holding it up. You know, sympathy to the Giants. We are ahead, you know, 4-1. This was it. My gosh, the way Newcomb was pitching, they just throwing BBs. You're saying, it's got to be all over. But it wasn't. Here is Alvin Dark, first hitter in the last half of the night. The count is one and two, and Newcomb does the right thing. He throws a waste pitch. It's going outside. And Dark swings and hits the ball like it had eyes. And you know that it's the beginning of aggravation. You just sense it, you feel it. It's like the dread is palpable. At that point, Dressen made a simple yet costly mistake by failing to notice that Gil Hodges was playing too close to the first base bag. With a three-run lead, Dressen should have told Hodges to play behind the runner. The Mueller ball, to me, was a 3-6-3 double play. If Hodges is positioned correctly, and if it's not a 3-6-3 double play, at least it's a force out at second. And that changes everything. Then Whitey Lockman proceeds to double down the left field line. And now I'm off the chair, almost resting on the ground because something's happening. Now it's 4-2, to two, and the Giants have second and third. The Giants rally brought the winning run to the plate. But before the game could continue, an injured Don Mueller, who had slid awkwardly at third, had to be removed from the field. During the delay, Dressen made his fateful decision. He would remove Newcomb and bring in his starter from game one, Ralph Branca. My arm was really stiff because I had pitched eight innings on Monday and pitched two innings on Sunday. And I just kept lob tossing from 40, 45 feet just to get loose. Ralph and I were up throwing. Charlie calls the bullpen. Clyde Sweeper answered the phone and he said, yeah, they're both ready. Who's got the best stuff? Clyde said, they're both throwing okay. And he bounced the curve while just when he was talking to him. Sook said, oh, Erskine just bounced the curve. Well, I had this hard overhand curveball that had to be low to be good. And Campy caught me through most of my career. Campy was hurt. Rube Walker was catching. Dressen said, I don't want any wild pitches in this situation. <laughs> and that's what he said, give me Branca. Ralph Branca, who wears his number 13. And will that be lucky for the Brooklyn Dodgers here in the last half of the night? I really don't remember the walk going from the bullpen until I got to the infield. And then I remember seeing Jackie and Pee Wee, and again saying, any butterflies? DeRosha was coaching at third. I remember him putting his arm around me, saying, Bobby, if you ever hit one, hit one now. <laughs> I thought to myself, Leo, you're out of your mind. I got to the mound, and Charlie said, get him out. And he turned and walked away. I started psyching myself up, telling myself, do a good job, give yourself a chance to hit USOB. And I get to home plate, and there's Branca on the mound. I hadn't even been aware they had changed pitchers. I was in the park all by myself. Concentration is so deep that you can't hear anything. The atom bomb could have gone off in center field, and I probably wouldn't have heard it. I wanted to get ahead of him, so the first pitch was, I mean, dead center, right down the middle. The guys on the bench wanted to kill me for taking that first fastball right over the middle of the plate. And the next pitch, I want to go up and in, waste the fastball. And I remember the second pitch. 
uh, coming in high in the side. And I remember just getting a glimpse of it and jumping on it. and back down and then I walked to center field which you know was a long walk. I had it on the home plate. Uh, I always felt like I was showboating taking that last big jump onto the plate into the arms of all the guys who were waiting for me. I felt like I was kind of bumping along there somehow with my feet not touching the ground and hyperventilating and I'm making these crazy noises. I remember getting in the locker room and then I laid down on the steps. I let the team down, I let the fans down, I let myself down. I almost felt nauseous for a little while from the excitement. It was wall to wall people. You couldn't even get your arms straight up. Did you know you were going to hit that home? Certainly didn't. Boy, I was just, it was just a dream all the time, and I, I don't believe it's happened yet. I just too good to be true. <laughs> then he put it right down for you. No, he didn't. He put it over my head, and I just swung at it. Well, I could see the fastball coming down the line. I thought, well, that's it. That's it. Oh, my God. Hitting it, I guess. But boy, it sure turned out great. Oh, you hit it great. Too good to be true. It's just hard for me to believe that this has happened. I remember taking a shower and feeling awfully lonely. Jackie was really the only one who came over and said something. Hey, hang in there. He said, if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have been in the playoff. People started leaving. This guy representing Perry Como asked me to go on down there. We'd like to have you on the Perry Como show. We'll give you $500 now. Ooh, I, hey, 500 bucks. I, I could use the $500, but you know, at a moment like this, I just want to get home and share it with my family. The guy said, well, Bobby, we really want you down there. We'll give you $1,000. Well, I thought for $1,000, <laughs> I guess the family can wait. Less than 24 hours later, the Giants faced the Yanks in a World Series they would lose in six games. Although that loss did little to diminish Thompson's feet, the admission of sign stealing has brought the home run's credibility into question. But those involved deny any playoff larceny. There was just too much turmoil with the commissioner's office and all the dignitaries that were in the clubhouse. It was too dangerous to even think of doing anything like that. I definitely remember the signs were not given during the playoffs because let's look at the facts. Bobby Thompson hit a home run off Brank in the first game at Ebbets Field. Um, did they have somebody sit in the center field seats given the signs in Ebbets Field? The next game, we move over to the polo grounds, and Clem Vine beat us 10 to nothing. Now, if we were getting the signs, we didn't have very much talent. Now, the last game, we're down 4 to 1. Were they getting the signs then? Sal Ivars is a lone giant dissenter, insisting to this day that his team stole the signs and perhaps the pennant. I'm up there, and I'm giving the signs. Bobby knew it was coming. Of course I didn't get the sign. It's ridiculous. I'll disagree with him. I think he had the sign. It's laughable. If you watch him swing at it, he attacks the ball. He leaps like a tiger pouncing on some wounded antelope. You can talk about all the signs you want in the world, but the answer is no. They'll never take anything away from me. I've never claimed too many things in my life, but never been a question on my mind that I won that day and Ralph lost.
despite the spirited debate, this much is certain. On October 3, 1951, at 358, in the gathering dusk of a gloomy fall afternoon, Scottish-born Bobby Thompson hit the most sensational home run in the history of America's pastime. With one stunning swing, the shot heard round the world ended a suffocating New York summer of unbearable drama and tension, and affected more lives in more ways than anyone could have imagined. I was sitting in foul territory, and I was screaming, curve, curve, curve. It only took a fraction of a second, but it was gone. I just dropped the wreath where I was. It seemed like New York and maybe the whole world stood still. There was silence everywhere. Just for that fraction of a second. All of a sudden, everything broke loose. My father kicks over the lamp. I just start screaming. The Giants won. <laughs> Thank God, the Giants won. People are banging on pots and tearing up newspapers and phone books and throwing the stuff out the window. Tears are rolling down my cheeks. I screamed all over a lot. I ruined eight takes on nine different movies from my carrying on. I've never thought of taking my life, but it passed by on October 3rd. And then I had to face the prospect of seeing Davy Freed. Davy Freed was a rub it in giant fan. So as we all came home that night, he would stand at the bottom of the train station and laugh. Just laugh. There were Dodger fans all over Glendale, Queens, where I lived. Copy, the cab driver who used to torment me, was on Myrtle Avenue. He saw me running through the rearview mirror, took off. He almost hit a fire engine. It was beautiful. There must have been 10 guys standing in front of my building yelling, Obelis, Obelis, come on down. We know you got to go to Hebrew school today. So here I come down wearing a black jacket, and it starts. He's in mourning. And the tears want to come, but I won't let them. And there's one fella, and I will never forget his name till the day I die, Steve Cooper, who finally said, leave him alone. He's had enough. My mother turned the television off. She walked into her bedroom, never said a word, closed the door. My father walks in white-faced. He says, where's mom? Bedroom. He opens the door, takes one look, closes the door. He said, I'm making supper. Now, my father never boiled an egg in his whole life. He opened up three cans of SpaghettiOs and popped three Royal Crown Colas. My mother did not come out until the next morning. Never said a word about that ball game. I never had the courage to ask. The shot heard around the world is embedded in our memories largely because of two artifacts that survive that home run. One is the newsreel footage of Thompson hitting the home run, and the other is Russ Hodge's famous call, the Giants win the pennant, the Giants win the pennant. The Giants win the pennant! The Giants win the pennant! For most people, we think that's the way Americans experience this game, hearing Russ Hodges make that call. But in New York City alone, fans had the option of listening to the game on the Dodger Network with Red Barber. Frank delivers the curve for and throw the deep back to left field. It is a home run. And the New York Giants win the National League pennant and the photo ground goes wild. On the Giant Network with Ernie Harwell and Russ Hodges, they could have listened to it on a national hookup with the Mutual Network. There was a Liberty hookup with Gordon McClendon. In addition, throughout the nation, this was the first nationally televised sports event. So this was a national event, and most people did not hear Russ Hodge's call, even though today most people can hear that and see that in their mind. The only reason we have that is that a Dodger fan in Brooklyn was listening to the game on the radio. He was sure the Dodgers were going to win going into the ninth inning. And so what he did was he wanted to tape not the Dodgers in victory, but he wanted to hear Hodges have to cry, as he said, as the Giants lost. 
So he put on his radio onto the giant station. He put the tape recorder next to the radio, and he ended up recording this famous call. And the ticket lobby it up, and they it off the field. I get mad when I hear that guy's voice. I get so mad, you have no idea how mad I get. For about 45 years, after the home run, whenever they would play that on a tape of something, I would run over to the TV and immediately turn it off. I'm going to get over that one of these days. It was only 50 years ago. you got to give me time to heal. Obviously, for the two principals, life after the home run was never the same. Thompson, the modest victor, and Branca, the affable vanquished, whose hardship would continue unrelenting for years. I drove home that night to Brooklyn with Ann, and you know, it was a long, lonely ride. And she started to cry, because we're gonna get married in 17 days. When I got home, my mother and father, of course, was disappointed, and I think they bled for me. My mother got a couple phone calls, teach your son how to pitch, you know, and it hang up. I mean, that's really vicious brothers and sisters who worked at the time, oh, your brother stinks, you know, your brother lost the game, and Ann going to a gas station and giving a credit card, and I said, hey, your husband threw the home run pitch, right? She didn't have to take that nonsense. Her cousin was the dean of campus ministries at Fordham, and I said, why me? You know, I was always in shape. I didn't drink or smoke, and baseball was my love, but why me? And he gave the Jesuit answer. He said, God chose you because he knew your faith would be strong enough to bear this cross. Like he had done coming to the game, Bobby Thompson returned home on the Staten Island Ferry, a humble hero hidden among the masses. My brother Jim was the first family member I bumped in on Staten Island. I remember saying, Jim, don't ask me what went on up there. The good Lord had to have something to do with that. And he said, no, Bob, do you realize what you did? And I thought, that was kind of a stupid question. I thought, of course I do. <laughs> I was up there. And he said, no, Bob. He says, you know, something like that might never happen again. And that's the first time I thought anything other than the fact that we beat the Dodgers that day. Nobody on the ball field at that time would ever have thought they'd be talking about this thing 50 years later, certainly. I didn't. Because of you, I should never been born. <laughs> because of you, Brooklyn fans are forlorn. Because of you, they yell, drop dead. <laughs> Several million. For half a century, Ralph Branca has carried the burden of Brooklyn's loss, yet somehow he's managed to do it with dignity. The day after giving up the home run, Branca showed up at the World Series gracious in defeat, an attitude he's comfortable with to this day. I wasn't going to crawl under a rock and stay there. It's just a ball game. I have nothing to be ashamed of. I'm happy with my life. I'm happy with what's happened. I've got a wonderful wife. I've got two wonderful daughters. I really have no regrets. In the years since the home run, Branca and Thompson have embraced their mutual moment, not as bitter rivals, but as friends, bound together in the historic drama of the shot heard round the world. We both worked in New York and we'd run into each other once in a while. We'd play in some golf tournaments together and see him at sports dinners or at a ball game here and there. And I got to like him and we became friends. Thank God it was Bobby, because he's a humble guy. He's had to live with it all these years, and I try to appreciate what he'd gone through, and I felt for him. We both realized who we were in the full terms of life. Without that moment, we'd be forgotten about as far as baseball history goes. I still think it's the greatest moment in baseball history.
my fame is sure Thanks to your Sunday pitch Up high or low I don't know which is which But come next spring Keep throwing me that thing And I will swing Because of you. <laughs> <laughs>